right, Lauren, you should be good. Good evening. Um, we are going to call to order the City Council and Planning Commission and BID Advisory Board workshop today is January 27th, 2021. Um, Madam Clerk, can you do roll call? Yes, I'll be doing roll call for Council. Council Member Hurtado? I'm here. Council Member Palomar? Here. Council Member Purcell? Here. Council Member Roman? Here. Mayor North? Here. Thank you. And item number two, I would like to open it up to any public comments. Any person may directly address the Council, Planning Commission, and BID Advisory Board at this time on any item not on the agenda or on any item that is allowed that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council a maximum of five minutes is allowed for each speaker is there anyone on the line Hearing none, we will close the public comment and item, agenda item number three, Brown Act and Conflict of Interest Training, presentation by City Attorney Michael Norman. Okay. Which one do you want me to start with? Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, good evening, everyone, and I thank you all for um, coming and participating in this workshop and training. Um, First of all, I need to uh, disclose to everyone that this first document that we are going to be using is not something that um, I can take credit for preparing. I found this on um, uh, by going through Google, candidly, and um, but I thought it was a, a good agenda type of document that gives a general um, outline of the issues that we're going to be talking about this evening. Um, and in addition to the Brown Act and the, um, the conflict of interest issues we'll be discussing, uh, this document also is, gives a good outline of the public hearing process. And that's not something that would specifically involve the bid advisory um, board, but um, certainly is an important part of the activities of the city council and the planning commission. And um, so I, I, I think that it's a, a good um, tutorial on just uh, understanding the ins and outs of the public hearing process. But why don't we start with the Brown Act? And um, as you can, as is stated in this in the first page of the handout, that um, all meetings of legislative bodies of a local agency are open to the public and all persons shall be permitted to attend any meeting of the legislative body of a local agency. And so that applies to the, um, plan, uh, the next one. applies to the, plan, the city council, the planning commission, any of the committees that the city council has um, created, um, community services um, and, and the like. And, and, and including the bid advisory board because the board was created by ordinance and is appointed by the city council. Um, and so the Brown Act applies to um, all of these agents, all of the committees and um, the city council and the planning commission. So all of these groups must comply with the terms and conditions of the Brown Act. Um, when we talk about a meeting, the definition of a meeting is includes any gathering of a majority of the members of the legislative body to hear, discuss, and deliberate upon an item with this, which is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the agents of that legislative body. And so um, all meetings of the city council and the planning commission and the other committees um, workshops of this character, even though they will not, none of the agencies will be making any decisions uh, this evening with regards to any issues within the subject matter jurisdiction of, uh, of, the, of that body. 
uh, because we have a majority or potentially a majority of members that would be present, certainly we have a majority of the city council who were present, that um, we have to notice and agendize the meeting. And that will apply, also, always applies to the planning commission and will also apply to the bid advisory board and any of the other commissions and committees um, of, the, of the city council. What is a meeting? Um, a meeting includes any use of direct communication, um, personal intermediary, intermediaries, which is an important part, or technical devices, which are employed by a majority of the members of the legislative body to develop a collective concurrence on action to be taken by members of the legislative body. So it's important. Meetings are fairly easy to understand and recognize. But then when we talk about personal intermediaries or technical devices, we have to um, be aware that um, those types of, of meetings are subject to the Brown Act. And when we talk about uh, personal interme intermediaries, we're talking about serial or rotating meetings, which means that uh, no member of a legislative body can for instance, contact the other members of the legislative body and take a poll to find out what they're thinking about a certain subject matter that, that's within the um, jurisdiction of the uh, legislative body. So council members can, the mayor cannot call up each of the council members and ask them what their thoughts are on a matter that's coming up on the, on the uh, next agenda and how they would vote or what their thinking is with regards to that. And the same would apply to the Planning Commission and the Bid Advisory Board and any of the other committees and commissions of the city. Um, but the meetings and, and we must be aware that that also involves, as it says at the bottom of the, of the slide, uh, email and texting. Because if you, it, it, it doesn't matter the means by which you communicate but it matters about what the content of the communication is. So whether or not there's a call on the telephone or whether on your cell phone or whether or not you email or text um, to communicate between members of the advisor of the legislative body, those types of communications are, um, may constitute a meeting would be sub and then would be subject to the Brown Act. And if those types of communications were taking place without being agendized as a meeting, then they are going to be in violation of the act. Um, on the next, okay. And so this helps you, is important to remember that the emails and text messages not only may constitute an improper communication, but um, they all, they're also subject to public disclosure under the Public Records Act. And it doesn't matter whether or not you're messaging on a personal device or a device that was provided by the city for use in your position uh, on one of the commissions or the committees or the council. And last year we had a specific we, we, we had a specific workshop with the council to talk about this and how um, when we're responding to public records requests that uh, potentially we would be looking at emails and texts messages um, that were communicated by the city council, um, not only to each other, but also to third parties. And so we all have to be very circumspect on how we use our personal communication devices when we're dealing with issues that um, are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the commission or the council or the board that we are, that you are participating in. Now there are several exceptions to the definition of meeting, and they're not on this um, handout, but I'd like to go over those briefly. Um, the individual contacts that you have, um, depending upon this, again, putting them outside of serial meetings or rotating meetings where you have communications with. Uh, other members on your board or commission are not considered a meeting. So if your neighbor comes to you and talks with you about something that's going on in the city, then um, you can 
have the, a conversation with that person, and that's not does not constitute a meeting. Um, if a majority of your board or commission or council goes to a conference like the League of Cities conference or trainings by the League of Cities, um, that is not considered a meeting if a majority of the council members or other members of the of committees go, so long as those members who are at the conference do not get together and talk about issues that are within the subject matter jurisdiction of their council or commission or committee. Um, the same is also true with regards to community meetings. If, the, um, if, a, if another organization schedules a meeting that and invites the community to be there, um, the League of Women Voters, or whatever the case may be, council members can attend, but again, they cannot gather together and talk or and talk about um, things that were, are within the subject matter jurisdiction of the council or the planning commission or the bid advisory board. Those, again, if they do that, that would be would constitute a meeting and would be in violation of, of the act. And so those, those, the same is also true with regards to retreats or workshops or things of that nature. But again, those, unless they're put on by a independent or a different organization, if, if there are workshops as we're doing today, or um, if the council does um, team building activities, or you know any of the committees do something like that. Those are meetings, and they would be subject to being agendized, and uh, would be subject to the act. Um, the next uh, slide just identifies what the penalties are from a legal standpoint, failing to comply with the act. And um, they identify various legal actions like injunctions and mandamus, and also the, any decision that is made outside of the purview of the act could be voided and um, would not be an enforceable decision. Um, when we talk about the Brown Act, one of the things, one of the most important parts of that, and again, it's not part of the handout, but I'd like to go through it briefly, that's with regards to agendizing the meetings. As we have tonight, um, the city clerk has uh, prepared an agenda for this meeting, which is required by the Brown Act, and then the agenda has to be posted in a public place um, and on our website, the city's website, within a certain period of time before the meeting. And then, because once that agenda is posted, whether it's for the council, the planning commission, the bid advisory board, or any other committee or commission of the city, then no other issues can be discussed at that meeting and no other decisions can be made as to any other issues that are not specifically identified on the agenda. And um, so it's important to make sure that each agency has um, properly put together the agenda and that it addresses the issues that are supposed to be coming before that committee or council or commission, and that no other issues can be discussed um, at that time during that meeting. Now, there are a couple exceptions to that, uh, and one of the most important exceptions that we've used previously um, with the city council is if an issue arises that needs to be considered by the city council, and the decision needs to be made before the next city council meeting. And many times that involves um, grant funding or things of that nature or an application needs to be in before the next meeting and there's council action that needs to be taken. The Brown Act provides an opportunity in those types of situations to allow the city council with a two thirds vote to put that item on the agenda and then to um, vote on that item as an action item and um, it, that by handling it in that fashion, it does not violate the Brown Act. But as part of that process, 
we have to make we have to make certain findings that, in essence, it is a situation that cannot be handled by the city council uh, before um, at the next council meeting, regular meeting, and therefore it needs to be handled at the meeting um, that's before the council that evening. Um, each of these, uh, the city council and the planning commission and the other committees can have special meetings if they need to have a special meeting to address a certain issue that has come before that needs to be decided at that time and again can't wait till the next regular meeting and um, so this Brown Act provides for special meetings um, with 24 hours notice but again the issue must be specifically uh, identified on the agenda and um, it must be something that needs to be done prior to the next regular meeting. Um, another part of the Brown Act that um, this handout does not uh, identify, and basically because um, it's based, it is most likely a item for the city council and very seldom is an item for the planning commission and most likely would not be an item with any committee or commission of the city council, and that's the closed session. And closed session is the time when the city council uh, can meet uh, outside of the public without public participation and with, at, at all to address certain issues that if they were addressed by in, in, the, in public uh, could have a uh, detrimental effect uh, with regards to the city and the um, of the city with regards to the issues that are handled in closed session. And the exceptions with closed session are discussions with legal counsel involved in litigation, um, conference with real proper negotiators. Um, those are two and um, employee um, labor negotiations and certain employee appointment and performance evaluations and employee discipline and renation and release. And so in those circumstances, uh, the city council can meet behind closed doors and can carry on discussions with regards to those issues. Uh, in order to involve in closed session, the matter may be properly agendized on the agenda so that the public knows that the city council is going into closed session um, and going to be conducting closed session. Uh, the law is very clear on the, the information that must be provided on the agenda for that item of closed session. Uh, the mayor must announce that we are going to go into, the council is going into closed session. And when closed session is concluded and the council comes out of closed session, it's, uh, they we're required to advise the public whether or not uh, a decision has been made in, by the city council in closed session that must be disclosed to the public or that no decision and no action has been taken and that has to be placed on the minutes of the meeting. And um, so uh, that's another item of involving the Brown Act. And again, it's most likely uh, just involving the city council, um, but if there is litigation against the city with regards to some action by the planning commission, it may be necessary also to go into closed session to discuss litigation involved in the planning commission. Um, part two of this handout, uh, we get into issues of um, how the how to conduct business, and this is for a planning commission. But it also is, these are items are equally true for both the city council and for all the commissions and committees of the city, including the bid advisory board. And when we look at this, we, the sequence, we're looking at the role of the, of the chairman or the mayor or the chairman of the planning commission or the <coughs> committee. Um, and quorum requirements, recruitals, which we will talk about with regards to conflict of interest, the presentation of evidence, uh, motions being made, and then the final decision being made. 
Um, as we talked about previously, if an item is not on, an, on the agenda for the meeting, um, there can't be any discussion of any item on, that's not on the agenda. Now, there are some exceptions to that. There's, you know, um, if an issue comes, you know, if issue comes up or there is a report by staff, um, there can be, you know, statements and questions and questions for clarification. Uh, the city council can refer staff uh, to seek other information on an issue. The, the committee can, or the council can request staff to report on something at a, a, a subsequent meeting or request future agenda items be placed on the agenda with, based upon certain decisions by um, the legislative body. But there can't be any specific deliberations or discussions or decisions made with regards to these issues that not, are not specifically on the agenda. Um, as you will note on the agenda we had this evening and on every agenda for um, each legislative body, whether it's the council, the planning commission, or one of the other commissions uh, of the city or committees, the public always has a right to speak on anything that's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the, leg of the body, but it is, that's not on the agenda. So um, as we do in council meetings and planning commission meetings, it's so this first item that the mayor identified after the roll call was public comment. And this is the time when the public can come and speak to the, to the body on anything that's not on the agenda. Um, usually in the, in the majority of cases, the body takes that information and can refer it to staff um, for a response or to, or to contact the person if they're requesting some action to be taken. Um, but it's not a situation where the city council or any commissions members or committee members get into a debate or an ongoing discussion with the person who is making the public comment. Uh, the appropriate thing to do is to take the public comment and then it can be, if it's a situation where it needs to be placed on an agenda for the consideration by the, the, the body that can be done or it can be referred to staff. And then as we do here in Kingsburg, we allow members of the public to speak on any item that's on the agenda. Um, if it's a public hearing, we have, and we'll get into that, we have specific um, ways in which that public comment is made, but in the normal course, if it's just an item on the agenda that the council is considering and it's not a public hearing item, then we give, everybody gives, everybody has an opportunity to speak on that item uh, before it goes to the council for final decision. And so that would be, uh, that would apply also to all of the committees um, and commissions um, of the city that are subject to the Brown Act. Um, now, when we get into any types of action, any types of agenda items, whether it's a public hearing or not, this refers to public hearing, but one of the first items that needs to be determined is whether or not there's a need for any rec recusals. And what we talk about when we talk about recusals is whether or not there are any, um, there is a need for any member of the council or any commission or committee to um, excuse themselves and recuse themselves from um, participating in that action because they have a conflict of interest. And, um, and so in or, when an item, before an item is called for consideration by the body, um, if someone has a conflict of interest, then they have to, um, we, we have to, ex they have to excuse themselves from participating in that. Abby, can you put this in? Yeah. 
Um, this second handout that we provided is information with regards to the Public Reform Act of 1974. And this, is, uh, this information uh, sets forth the basis for um, determining whether or not there's a conflict of interest and whether or not there needs to be a disqualification and recusal of, um, of the person who's participating on the board or committee or council. Um, the general rule is that public officials and those in, uh, are prohibited from making, participating in, or in any way attempting to use their official position to influence a governmental decision in which they know or have reason to know they have a financial interest. And a financial interest is defined as, as, as if, it is a re if it's reasonably foreseeable that a decision will be made will have a material financial effect distinguishable from its effect on the public in generally on the official or member of his or her immediate family. So the, um, the basis for the recusal is if there is a financial interest and if it's reasonably foreseeable and that any decision that's made will have a material financial effect on the individual, the official, or the member of the committee uh, that is, or council that is making the decision. And, which go to the next page, please. Yeah, on this one. Yeah, on this one. And there is an eight part test um, that the public, um, Reform Act provides to determine whether or not there is in fact a conflict. And, you know, it, the first one is whether or not it's a public official. Um, but again, being on one of the committees or commissions, um, you are not an elected person from the standpoint of as they are on the council. But if, for instance, on the planning commission, they're, they are making decisions on various land use items and issues that may have a financial effect on one of the um, commission members. So these, even though they use the words uh, official, these um, rules apply to anyone who is um, on any of the city commissions or councils or committees. Um, so you, you are on the, on the body you're going to make a governmental decision. Um, we have to determine whether or not the public official has an economic interest potentially affected, uh, whether or not it's a direct or indirect economic interest, and whether or not it's material. Um, and that standard depends upon whether an economic interest is directly or indirectly involved in the decision. If it's reasonably foreseeable, the financial effect of a decision is reasonably foreseeable if there is a substantial likelihood that that, that financial effect will occur. Um, and that, that, financial, that effect is not going to be the same as the effect would be on the public generally. So those are the considerations that need to be made uh, by an individual on the city council or the planning commission or one of the committees as to whether or not they have a conflict of interest um, and so should recuse themselves from that decision. And um, the way that we like to handle that is, that to, is to err on the side of um, being conservative and if it, there, um, because there, even though there may not be a specific um, conflict as identified under the rules, there may be an, an, an appearance of conflict or an appearance of impropriety in voting on and, and participating in the item that is before the body um, at that point in time. And so we normally recommend that even if there is not, it would not be specifically a legal conflict, but it, 
you know, it, there may be some gray area that we recommend that the um, person who was involved on the, in that circumstance recuse themselves. And what that recusal involves is number one, that they are not counted as part of the quorum for purposes of the decision that's going to be made. Um, you have to announce the conflict on the record and identify the conflict, how it is, um, how it affects you from the standpoint of a financial interest. And then the person recusing themselves must leave the room so that there isn't any appearance that that person is attempting to influence the decision, even though they're not sitting um, with the other members of the body. Of the body. And um, so each time when, when you have an agenda before you, uh, before the meeting, and in reviewing the agenda, each member of a, any of the bodies that we're talking about this evening must look at the agenda and the items on the agenda and first make a determination as to whether or not there's a potential conflict of interest. And you can use this document that we've provided to go through and make, and make that determination. And if there's any question in your mind about whether or not there is or is not a conflict of interest, um, I'm always happy to talk with, take phone calls and talk with everybody about that and uh, make a decision with the member of the body as to whether or not it is, and whether or not there is a conflict and whether or not the recusal should take place and then the method by which the recusal is, is, is accomplished at the time of the meeting. Um, and so it's very important that we all comply with um, those provisions and uh, again, it is always my recommendation that um, if there is any appearance that there may be a conflict of interest, that uh, the member of the body recuse themselves, and um, so that they so that they do not participate in the meeting. Um, the one exception to this uh, re these requirements is if there is a legal need to participate in the meeting. And that normally occurs in some circumstances, usually in land use issues or annexation issues or things of that nature, where we have maybe two or three council members or members of the board who um, may be affected by the decision. And therefore, without the participation of at least one of them, the council cannot act. And the and the, uh, the Political Reform Act makes ex an exception to that and allows for um, persons who may have a conflict and would be subject to recusal to participate so as to not prohibit the legislative body from carrying out their duties and responsibilities and making decisions that the law allows them to make. Um, so that has happened a few times, but not very often. So, um, but that is one exception to to the act and to the recusal. Um, and so, um, go on. Yeah. So again, um, there must be a financial interest, and most importantly, um, the third bullet point there is to raise any possible conflict early and well before the meeting, and you know and make a determination as to what that, if there is a conflict, um, you know, have the conversation with me, um, and then that decision is made before the meeting so that at the time of the meeting, the, con the refusal can take place as required by the law, and um, the council or the body can then carry on their um, activities. Um, when we're talking about um, making decisions um, at meetings and and especially with public hearings, there's always the issues of due process. Um, and that means that um, when we're making decisions, it's necessary, especially in the public hearing process, that those decisions are made based upon information 
and evidence that is submitted at the time that the matter is considered on the agenda by um, the City Council, the Planning Commission, or, or the other committees and boards. And so one of the issues that we sometimes have to deal with when we're dealing with these due process issues is um, contacts outside of the meeting. Um, and sometimes this, you know, under this slide, it identifies developers because the, these documents are, this packet relates to activities by the planning, by planning commissions, but the same is true for the city council and also the other boards and committees. That if someone contacts you on an issue that is on, that's going to come up on the agenda, especially public hearings, is that, you know, first of all, you try to avoid, you try, you don't initiate the contact. Um, our recommendation always is if there are matters on the, on the agenda, especially if there are public hearing issues that uh, uh, members of the planning commission or the city council or otherwise do not initiate discussions with participants in those act, in those items that are going to be testifying before the, the, the body. And um, but if you are contacted, you obviously are polite and avoid stating a viewpoint because you don't want to disclose that viewpoint uh, at the you know without doing so at the meeting. And then at the public hearing or at the at the time of consideration of the item on the agenda, if you've received any information outside of the meeting that you believe is relevant to the hearing or the decision being made on the agenda, that you have to disclose that information on the record at the time that the uh, item is considered by the, by the council or, or the commission or um, any other body uh, so that that information is available to everyone on the legislative body. Um, and that also, the only exception to that is if there are um, issues, and again, usually the planning commission or the city council, we've done this several times in the past, if there are issues that are specific to a development site or with regards to code violations or things of that nature, it may be necessary to inspect the site prior to the public hearing. And sometimes we've done that. But the main issue, I think, of, of most importance is to make sure that, to the, that you can avoid uh, these types of contacts and discussions about issues on the agenda before they come up um, on the agenda by the body. Um, on the next slide, we just talk about some of the issues that um, may make it from a parliamentary procedure standpoint um, that are not appropriate, but also can cause some legal issues for the city if um, they are not handled appropriately. Um, one of those is someone on one of the bodies of planning commission or a city council member or one of the members of the commissions making comments and expressing opinions before the matter is considered on the agenda or before it, they commence the public hearings because that ad identifies decisions or feelings that were made or th that you have that should be expressed in the meeting and not prior to the meeting. Um, also, you know, we try to avoid debating with speakers speaking in favor or against an item. Um, and then after we close the public hearing, um, raising issues or facts not presented at the public hearing, or letting people discuss the matter and having citizens again come up to speak in front of the council or the planning commission after the public hearing has been closed because, tech, because that evidence not be considered by the City Council or the Planning Commission without reopening the public hearing. And so, again, any it, the, the dialogue, the discussion, 
the pre presentation of evidence, the presentation of positions for and against a, ma a matter, especially when we're having a public hearing, must be, dis must be discussed and presented at the time of the hearing, not prior to or after the closing of the hearing or the matter on the agenda. Um, next one. The, um, in certain circumstances, especially in public hearings, or as set forth in the municipal code, um, findings need to be made by the planning commission or the city council to support the decision that um, has been made by that body. Um, and so when that happens, staff will usually prepare the findings um, for the council or the planning commission that will show up on the staff report. But, um, and those findings need to be followed or they need to be changed or modified, um, but they will become a part of the decision that is being made by the planning commission or the city council. And, um, and that that would be the basis of the decisions that would then proceed um, to final this to the final action by the planning commission or the city council. Um, if there is a need for continuance of a matter, uh, any member of the planning commission or city council or any member of any of the committees or commissions can make a motion to continue a matter to the next meeting. Um, and that decision is then decided by a roll call vote or uh, of the members of the body, and then the hearing is continued to a specific date. If it's a public hearing matter, um, then either the public hearing is continued um, and remains open as continued, or if the public hearing has been closed and that meeting has been continued, uh, the chairman of the planning commission or the mayor has the ability to um, um, reopen the public hearing and take additional testimony uh, before closing the public hearing and taking the, the item to um, to the commission or the council as a whole. Um, all actions by each of the members of the city council, the planning commission, or any of the commissions or boards are done by motion. And any member of the body, once the um, discussion and the public comment and all of those items are concluded, um, then the, this, any decision just made by any of the bodies is done by motion. And any member of the body can make a motion to approve or deny or continue a matter. Um, the chairman of the planning commission or the mayor or, or the chairman of any of the committees can also make a motion, but only after all other members have had an opportunity to make a motion on the question and nobody has made a motion. So the chairman or the mayor of, uh, has that ability, but only after no motions have been made or and, um, and no other member of the body is inclined to make a motion. And then as, as we all understand, any motion that's made must be seconded, otherwise it dies for lack of a second. And any motion may be withdrawn at any time by the maker of, of uh, the motion, but, it, but if the motion has been seconded, then the person seconding the motion must also consent to having the motion withdrawn. And if somebody who seconds the motion withdraws their second, then the motion is lost and is not going to be considered unless someone else seconds the motion. Um, motions can be amended on the floor uh, at any time um, and amendments must be voted on first, then the main motion can be voted on after the uh, amendment. Then there, you, can sub, you can also substitute motions. A motion may be amended um, to retain the basic motion on the floor, but modified in some way. 
So if there's a motion on the floor, um, someone can seek to modify the motion and um, everyone needs to vote as to whether or not the motion is going to be modified and then the motion proceeds to, the substitute motion proceeds to vote first and if passed, then that terminates the original motion. Um, again, these are simple things, but um, voting is always, you know, by, we do it here by roll call vote. Um, if there's a abstention due to conflict of interest, um, again, uh, the person who's conflicting out and recusing themselves are not considered for purposes of the quorum on that matter. If there are tie votes, then the, any motion that's made, if it's a tie vote, then the motion is fails unless an additional motion is made and obtains a majority vote. Um, and if there's and if there's a, a matter that's being appealed by the, to the city council from an action by the planning commission, so to speak, then um, if there's a tie vote, then the decision by the planning commission would be upheld. So. Any tie votes constitute no action by the city council or the planning commission or any of the bodies. So, um, so we try to avoid the tie votes. Um, this is just a little thing at the very end uh, that we think of for fairness and merit-based decision-making in your decisions, you work as a team, try to keep politics separate from relationships with, you know, with staff and the public, um, and again, avoid committing or commenting before a public hearing or before a meeting um, on the matters that are going to be before the agenda. Um, that's kind of a quick overview of a number of issues. Um, candidly, the best way to um, feel comfortable with these issues and, and to have a good, a better understanding of them is just through using them and attending the meetings and um, getting involved in the activities of the board or commission or council that you're on and um, learning from experience as to how these work. And um, so well, we've tried to keep within our one hour time limit and I'm happy to answer any questions if, that anybody has with regards to any of these issues. Does anybody have any questions? They're all very smart people. Yeah. <laughs> you just did a very thorough job. So, and also, if anybody has questions after this evening or after you go through the handouts and I would recommend that you do and also um, on the Zoom um, invitation that Abigail sent out um, there are two uh, links there and they're both very helpful. The first link is just a, a listing of various resources um, from uh, League of California cities that are helpful in a variety of areas. Um, and the second link is, is I think, the most important because what that link is, it, it is a booklet and it is put out by the League of California cities and it's the open and public, it's the, it's the Brown Act in a pamphlet. And it's the same one that we use here at the city. And um, I would recommend to all of you that you um, either save that link if you can or print the document because it answers all of the Brown Act questions you would ever want to ask. And one of the most important things about this document is it gives um, examples of circumstances that you may find yourself in or have questions about with regards to how the Brown Act applies to that very to that specific circumstance, and it gives answers to those questions. And so, I would recommend that all of you um, 
read through that document in your spare time and get it will give you a very good understanding of the Brown Act and as it applies to your specific uh, committee or commission. And um, I think it would be very helpful for all, all of you. Mike, this is Councilman Palomar. I have a question. Yes, sir. Yeah, the question is, um, I have a question about texting. Um, is it a Brown Act violation for uh, texting someone like in council chambers or someone not in council chambers about an agenda item such as like a developer or a business owner? Is that, is that a Brown Act violation? For you council mean while the meeting? You yeah, during the meeting, meeting yes. Yeah, I'm not sure if well, that came up or... Well, again, if it's if you're not commun if you're communicating with somebody, if you're not communicating with some not communicating with somebody that's a member of the city council, um, it, that uh, on a matter that's that you're not, if if you're I'm talking about a council somebody, member. I'm talking about a, say say a council member is texting somebody, like a developer that's at home about an agenda item. His agenda item is that a Brown Act violation? No, it's not a Brown Act violation. It could be a, if the matter, if they're texting while a public hearing is going on, that involves the developer's property in that circumstance and, and the land use entitlement that the developer is seeking during the public hearing that's going on in the city council, that would violate our the public hearing requirements and issues that we were talking about a little while ago, because that that testimony or that information that's being texted back and forth should be part of the public hearing record, and um, and so that testimony should be being provide, prov provided to the entire council at the public hearing by the developer, not through texting back and forth between the council member and the developer. But it's not specifically a Brown Act violation. I see. So if that is happening, you you should disclose that to the council members yes. w while it's happening. I understand. Okay. How about yeah. how about yeah. council Any members text? Yeah. How about council members texting each other uh, during the meeting about agenda items? Should that be brought up also? Well, I I mean. It, it doesn't, it's not an, I don't think it's an appropriate thing to do. I mean, if there are issues that need to be discussed on an agenda item before the council, you know, it, it that is, a, that could be a violation of the Brown Act because the Brown Act requires that, that the discussions on agenda items that are before the council that evening need to be stated in public, not in private and by, texting back and forth between members on an agenda item that's being considered by the council, then that those discussions and that information uh, that's going back and forth is not uh, being discussed and open in the public, and that could constitute a violation of the act. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, then uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we will adjourn the workshop. Thank you.